people I've worked with who have died in the line of duty. I wouldn't probably wouldn't have done it if I wasn't getting paid for it. I've had my heart stopped four times. There's little chance of survival if you get into something bad. Most people, when they think of venom, they think of death. When I think of venom, I think of life. Go, go, go! The margin for error is very small. This bridge is, is heartless and unforgiving. This could be life or death. This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to this special edition of Nightly Business Report. I'm Sue Herrera. And I'm Bill Griffin. You know, every night we bring you reports on the stories that move markets around the world. Now, with the markets closed for this Labor Day holiday, we decided to bring you something a little different, stories that you don't often see about the people who do some of America's most dangerous jobs. We are going to introduce you to the folks who make a living putting their lives on the line. As they battle deadly blazes, for example, with an elite team of parachuting firefighters. They brave Mother Nature's wrath with a man who climbs the world's most treacherous peaks. You can punch the time clock with a UFC fighter who has kicked, slugged, and bled her way to a budding empire. And meet the man who has cheated death more times than he can count. And you will not believe why he wrestles venom from the most lethal cobras on Earth. But first, at a median salary of $48,000 per year, your neighborhood firefighter battles deadly temperatures of over 1,000 degrees. But some are drawn to duties where the danger is amped up, way up. We're a group of firefighters delivered by airplane, parachute into the fires. Phil Lind is part of an elite group of firefighters called smoke jumpers. People I've worked with have died in the line of duty. It's something that is part of the job. It's sobering. That's why I take a great pride in trying to do it right. You all right, hero? Yeah, I got you. These brave men and women skydive from a death-defying 3,000 feet into hell on earth, fighting wildfires too hard to reach by road. Jumper okay. Yeehaw. The most fun of my job, I would say, is the jumping out of the airplane. Yeah, it's our three minutes of good times. Once you hit the ground, you're working like every other firefighter. You truly feel the force of nature, no question about it. You know, I've stood on the edge with the wind at my back and looked at 300 foot flame lengths and been in awe to the point where someone's like tapping me on the shoulder saying, we're getting out of here. There are only about 475 smoke jumpers like Phil in the entire country. And since they work miles from civilization, they don't even have access to the most basic firefighting tools like water and hoses. So how do they fight these infernos? You're gonna use hand tools, you're gonna to use chainsaws, you're gonna take before you everything down to bare mineral soil. Anything that has the ability to conduct fire from one area to another. It is ditch digging to its finest. Of course, with the flames spreading like, well, wildfire, it's a race against the clock and the elements. That's why Phil and the other smoke jumpers work grueling 16 hour days, sometimes weeks at a time. This is a very labor intensive job. And that's what appeals to so many of us about it. You know, and that's how that esprit de corps develops is you're there with people right next to you, suffering with you. And the flames aren't the only hazard of the job. Phil's had some hard landings that have left him with broken bones. He's even been impaled by a tree branch. I've been told by every doctor that you won't come back. You won't walk right again. You won't walk without a cane. Then there's a less obvious danger. You are in the woods. There's plenty of animals to be concerned about. If we encounter some problem grizzly bears, we're gonna order a smoke jumper with a shotgun and they're gonna defend camp. You may be wondering, how much do these badass, bear-fighting, skydiving human fire extinguishers make? I usually gross about 85,000. I've yet to work with a firefighter that does it for the money. I sure as heck wouldn't jump out of planes or risk my life to make money. I'd go back to school and get a degree in something to make real money. So why does he do it? I think it's important that we protect the natural resources that we have. I love my job because of the kind of people I get to work with. Everyone I work with has my back. I work hard to have their back. So, I mean, how could I not love working for a job where it's got people like that in it? Heck yeah! Nice job, brother. <laughs> now, smoke jumping isn't the only job that takes danger to new heights. Blistering winds, crippling temperatures, and avalanches that strike without warning. So meet the man who works in a place where just about everything can kill you. I'm a mountain guide expedition leader. 
and I lead people up the highest mountains in the world. Garrett Madison owns Madison Mountaineering, which specializes in guiding amateur adventure seekers up several of the world's most treacherous peaks. Garrett leads about 10 expeditions a year, taking care of every detail, from planning routes to rationing food and supplies. Step and rest. It's his job to lead his clients on their climbs and keep them safe from Mother Nature's wrath. There's avalanches, icefall, rockfall, crevasses, altitude illness potential. So all of these things make it very dangerous. Much of his business is done here on Mount Everest, where Garrett takes up to a dozen clients a year. For me on Everest, the first time was incredible getting to the top. But now coming back, I enjoy helping other climbers realize their goal. It's a bucket list type thing, something they've dreamed about for years and decades, maybe their whole life. But on the world's tallest peak, an exhilarating hike can turn into a deadly tragedy in no time. Marissa Eve Girawong was one of the first Americans reported dead after a massive earthquake caused an avalanche. In 2015, 18 people died on Everest in a catastrophic avalanche disaster, including Garrett's team doctor, Eve Garawong. Losing Eve was very hard for everybody, obviously, her family, her friends, myself. And I thought, gosh, is this really something I should be doing with my life? Should I continue climbing? After some serious soul searching, Garrett ultimately returned to work. I didn't want to walk away from the mountain or quit on such a low note. There's Everest. When I'm helping other climbers get to the top. You got it. I can feel their excitement, their joy, like I've had this amazing positive contribution onto their lives. Over the last eight years, Garrett says he's taken more climbers to the top of Everest than any other guide. And despite the ever-present dangers, he thinks business is good. A good year, everything goes smooth, I could make about six figures. If I have a bad year, and lose equipment like I have several times in various natural disasters, I could lose a lot. There's no reason to cut corners. This could be life or death. Now, while some make their livings battling the elements, this woman does so by battling the enemy. And she does it in front of millions of adoring fans. This is Paige 12 Gage Van Zandt, a professional fighter in the UFC, and her nickname pretty much says it all. I like punching people in the face. Our body is our tool, it's our weapon. At 5'4", 115 pounds, Paige Van Zandt is about the size of the average ballerina. But she'll take you down and get paid good money to do it. 12 Gage! After years of training as a hobby, she got an offer to turn pro and took it. I was working as a bank teller and I got offered the pro fight and I asked for some time off and they said I couldn't have time off, so I just took time off anyway and took the fight. And then I was, I was fired. It was a career move that paid off. At 23, Paige is now a rising star and fan favorite in the brutal Ultimate Fighting Championship. A lot of people are surprised when they find out that I'm a fighter, obviously I don't I guess look like a fighter. I think girls can do absolutely anything they want to, so there shouldn't be this stigma behind you have to be manly to be a fighter. You just have to want to fight. And while she doesn't seem too concerned about the effects fighting could have on her well-being... You really can't live your life thinking about every single bad thing that can happen to you. She also doesn't pull any punches when it comes to the hazards of her job. The worst thing that happens is you could die. There's been significant injuries. People have had, like, broken skulls and stuff like that. Of course, Paige does get paid for all the blood, sweat, and, well, more blood. The UFC definitely takes care of their athletes. It's an amazing corporation to work for. Her total UFC haul so far, an impressive 335,500 bucks over 10 fights. That includes some huge rewards for Paige's ruthless fighting style. A $50,000 bonus for fight of the night and another 50 G's for knockout of the night during her UFC debut. The girl I fought probably technically was better than me, but I wanted it more than she did and I fought more than she did. It really was the biggest thing that changed my life and after I won that fight, I went from not being able to afford gas to getting a $50,000 bonus. But it was Paige's fourth UFC fight, one that she lost, that really sent her career and bank account to new heights. My eye got cut open and I was just like bleeding profusely everywhere. So I fought through like five rounds of total war. So that's where I really got noticed. I got more fans off of that fight than 
my opponent did, and she won. Because of that, I got Dancing with the Stars. Paige kicked it on the dance floor, too, finishing in second place and earning a whopping $345,000 along the way. I wouldn't probably wouldn't have done it if I wasn't getting paid for it. That business sense has also helped Paige land endorsement deals with Reebok, Monster Energy Drinks, Metro PCS, and Harley Davidson. The thing with fighting is you never know how long you have in the career. So it's all about setting yourself up for the successes outside of the cage as well. Brave and business savvy Paige Van Zandt is one opponent you don't want to underestimate. Coming up, you think your job is stressful? Try fixing the world's highest voltage power lines while dangling from a helicopter. And you can learn the surprising reasons why this man devotes his life to milking poisonous snakes. But first, our resume rewind quiz. What dangerous job did Pope Francis have before joining the clergy? The answer, a little bit later. Now, smoke jumping, as we showed you earlier, isn't the only job that takes danger to new heights. Of the top 10 deadliest jobs in America, half are performed in the air, including loggers and power line workers. Then there are the jobs that are highly unusual and dangerous, like the workman who maintains the Gateway Arch in St. Louis at 630 feet. Unbelievable. Or the brave crew that inspects the One World Trade Center spire at nearly 1,800 feet. So now we'll take a look at a group of guys who make a living really putting their lives on the line. Power line, that is. You have to always be alert, always be on your A-game. It don't take much voltage to stop your heart. John Brooks is part of a skilled team that installs and repairs the world's highest voltage power lines, live wires coursing with more power than 400 electric chairs. There's little chance of survival if you get into something bad. Severe burns, you can lose arms and legs, and you're not going to go home from it. In fact, dozens of power line workers die each year. But for these guys, the danger is amplified even further because they do most of their work using helicopters. You see, John and his teammates are what are called aerial linemen. Their employer, Haverfield Aviation, specializes in servicing power lines that can only be accessed by chopper in some of the country's most unforgiving terrain. Helicopters are dangerous and power lines are dangerous. When you put the two together, you have double danger. That's John and his teammates headed to a rusted out service tower high up in the Appalachian Mountains. To get there, they're dangling from a chopper, traveling at breakneck speeds, all while wielding chainsaws. Now, there's so many things that we have to watch for. It's pretty mind-boggling. To make matters worse, most of John's work is done hovering at an elevation most chopper pilots are trained to avoid, called the dead man's curve. When I'm about to do something and I think, well, if I cut this corner, I can get it done faster, I remember my kids and my wife at home, and that stops me dead in my trash because I don't want my kids standing over my casket crying because daddy took a shortcut. Despite the dangers, John says he knew he wanted this job the moment he saw the Haverfield team in action. Where I live, there's not a whole lot of jobs. So the good Lord really blessed me when he, he moved me here. I'm just an old hillbilly. Never one time have I ever been on an airplane or anything before I hired in here. While the average power line worker makes about 67 grand a year, aerial linemen can make a lot more. I probably make around 90,000 a year to 100,000 maybe. And I'm not one of the top paid guys. For me, it's not all about the money. The truth of it is, people goes to Six Flags and pays a lot of money to get to take a little old ride, and I get paid to do something even better than any of that. Keeping the national grid going is very important. I can get emotional thinking about it, but I, I am privileged. I've been blessed. Here's a shocking statistic. More than 7,500 people have been electrocuted on the job since 2011, while nearly 4,800 people have been struck, caught, or crushed. But one of the most surprisingly common workplace injuries is getting bitten. Yeah, about 6,000 mail carriers are bitten by dogs each year. And then there's this man. I actually, I've been on the respirator several times. I've had my heart stop four times. My finger was dangling. This is Jim Harrison. I was in a coma. I went into acute respiratory arrest twice. He spends a lot of time in the hospital with work-related traumas, what you might call reptile dysfunctions. No, 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 no. Go behind me. Yep. Go behind me. 
because Jim is a professional venom extractor. Well, he's really smiling. <laughs> he's showing his teeth pretty good. Jim spends his day wrangling the world's deadliest snakes in the Kentucky Reptile Zoo, the tourist attraction slash research facility that he runs with his wife. It's home to the largest collection of venomous snakes in the world. The last bite I had was from a South American rattlesnake and I had descending paralysis within minutes. I don't remember leaving the parking lot here. So why risk life and limb to milk snakes in the first place? Well, to help mankind, of course. King Cobra venom is being used for two things, pain medication research. It's also being used in cancer research. That's right. There's a theory in the medical world that venom can destroy cancer cells much like chemo does, a prospect that's created a growing marketplace for venom and its vendors. In fact, Jim sells an estimated quarter of a million dollars worth of venom each year to pharmaceutical companies and research labs. King Cobra Venom runs about $100 a gram. But raising 2,000 snakes has its costs as well. In addition to the zoo's standard expenses, Jim spends a whopping $25,000 a year on mice. Because, well, snakes gotta eat. It's a labor of love. I mean, we have to have a passion to do it. But it's not something where you're gonna get rich quick. No, you're not. On average, snake milkers earned around $30,000 a year. But Jim? Well, he's far from average. He's chosen to pump all of his venom earnings back to the zoo, leaving himself with a paycheck of absolutely nothing. There's a reason I don't take a salary. I do it just to try to save lives. Most people, when they think of venom, they think of death. When I think of venom, I think of life. I basically volunteer my life to save other people's lives. Yes, Jim Harrison has picked his poison in life, and he's sticking with it. Paycheck and pointer fingers be damned. Keeping it in the reptile family now, we head to Texas to meet one enterprising woman. Who traps monstrous gators for a living. This 900 pound angry alligator is named Godzilla. And the 120 pound blonde on his back is Christy Kroboth. Christy earns a living tracking, wrestling, and capturing these violent beasts. And here in South Texas, where the gator population is over half a million and growing, these fiercely territorial predators are invading parks and neighborhoods, turning the local kids and pets into very vulnerable prey. He's mad, he's hissing. That's where Christy and her partner Chris come in. Roar! It takes a lot of courage. You know, my mind's telling me, stop, get back, it's dangerous. But then the other part of me is, you know, this is your job, you gotta get this gator. And the way they get these gators just might surprise you. Here's Chris sneaking up on a gator with a regular old fishing rod. Once he reels it in close to the surface, Christy wrangles it with a lasso before wrapping its jaws shut with her signature pink tape. We're gonna get the hook out of her, take her down to our farm. The goal, to safely relocate each capture to a nature preserve. So I got into the nuisance alligator program because most of the guys go out and they kill the alligators. So I got into it to beat the guys out there and to take the animal alive. And she makes a decent chunk of change doing it. If it's a small little three, you know, foot alligator underneath a car, that'll be real quick, you know, 100 to $200. But if it's a company and they have an alligator in their pond, it'll be anywhere from, you know, eight to $900. On average, Christy and her partner trap 150 alligators a year, and each can bank a total of 60 grand annually. Oh, we know we're not going to get rich catching alligators. We do this because we truly love what we do. We love helping these animals. I'd rather work with animals over people any day. It's staying on your toes and really just paying attention to the animals. Coming up, we go back to death-defying heights with the brave men whose office is hundreds of feet off the ground. And then find out what drives this man to plow ahead first into tornadoes. But first, the answer to our resume rewind quiz. Before joining the clergy, Pope Francis had not one, but two dangerous jobs, running tests in a chemical lab and strong-arming unruly partiers as a nightclub bouncer. Who knew that, right? And then he becomes Pope. How about that? There you go. But now to more Oklahoma, Joplin, Missouri, and Birmingham, Alabama. These three towns were devastated by twisters that killed over 200 people in just a matter of minutes. So now meet the man who was there for all three on purpose. 
I'm a storm chaser and an extreme meteorologist. Intercept it, intercept it, John. Yes, while most people hunker down and pray, Reed Timmer drives into tornadoes head on using a customized SUV that can withstand crushing 200 mile per hour winds. Blast through, we're going inside. You know, these tornadoes can obviously be very deadly and very dangerous and you have to respect their power. Here it comes. But I guess it is you know, a sense of adventure also. I mean, when I see a tornado out in the field, it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. It's almost looks like it's not from this planet when you see one up close. But he's not risking his life just for the thrill of it. He does it to save lives. Storm chasers are the eyes you know, out in the field underneath these storms that are reporting to National Weather Service forecasters, to news media, and then they can notify people in the path of these storms to take shelter and hopefully save their life. Guys, you need to take this seriously. This is a large, fast-moving, rapidly rotating tornado. I've seen the dark side of these storms, and that's what uh, storm chasers are trying to prevent. As for pay, on average, storm chasers can earn around 70 grand a year, mostly by licensing jaw-dropping footage like this to media outlets. Woo! Reed earned a little more than that thanks to a gig on the Discovery Channel series Storm Chasers. Right in front of us, it's a massive tornado. Still, he says he's definitely not saving up for retirement, and that suits him just fine. I mean, everything that I've ever made goes right back into storm chasing, goes back into the gas living on the road, equipment, but I do it because I love science, I love storms, I love storm chasing. Not only are you doing what you love, but you're also helping to save lives at the same time, so that makes it a, a great thing. Storm chasers aren't the only ones who face dangers on the open road. Roadway incidents account for approximately one quarter of all fatal workplace injuries. Truck drivers rank as the seventh most dangerous job in America. Then there are some unsung road warriors who you probably did not even know existed until now. With more than 100 million vehicles crossing it every year, the George Washington Bridge is the busiest bridge in the world. Indeed, and while most people are familiar with the toll booth workers who make their living working on the bridge, many have no idea about those who work way above them at death-defying heights. Bridge painters, part of a brave crew that works year-round to ensure this $610 million per year moneymaker is operational at all times. Some people just say we're crazy. A little crazy may be part of the job requirement. Every day, these guys weave in and out of steel mazes, rigging, climbing, scraping, and painting the rusted steel, all while hundreds of feet in the air. The margin for error is very small. This bridge is, is heartless and unforgiving. Todd Whitehill is the bridge crew boss and has been helping to maintain this structure for 22 years. If you think about it, there's an element of danger in almost every trade we do. For us, the prospect of something catastrophic, life is not without risk. So why did Todd accept a job that puts his life at risk? His answer is pretty simple. The job was available, it was steady work, good paying, I wanted a house and I want to get my daughter through college. The average bridge painter starts out at about 31,000 per year and tops out at about 71,000. And with more than 9 million square feet of paintable surface and a crew of only 16, you could say these guys have the ultimate job security. It literally is never ending. This bridge isn't going to lay you off. There's always something to do here. But getting used to the conditions up here is certainly not for the faint of heart. Not too many people can do this job. And us that do it, we take a lot of pride in it. That's why applicants who want to join this dream team must prove they have nerves of steel first. We want to make sure that you're qualified to handle the heights. We can't teach that. Step one, a freight elevator ride to the peak of the tower. Step two, a stomach-churning walk over these see-through grates with traffic whizzing below, which leads candidates to the final test, something like walking the plank. The job is to start at that side and then walk across the six-inch beam to the other side. And this is what they see from up there, a sight that would paralyze most people with fear. No crying yet, no throwing up yet. Uh, there's a few people that just barely make it out of the elevator. But if you can get past the fear, one thing's for certain, even the world's plushest corner offices don't have a view like this. I got the most beautiful office in the world. I have the Jersey skyline on one side, I have the New York skyline on the other, beautiful river, it never gets old. 
Good for him. That's a great attitude to have for a job like that. <laughs> you have but to have I'll it. I'll tell you what, I'll stay in my nice warm television studio. Me too. Yeah. So thanks so much for watching this special edition of Nightly Business Report and for taking the time to meet some of the people who do the world's most dangerous jobs. I'm Sue Herrera. And I'm Bill Griffith. A special thank you to all the people who do work on this program. And there were many of them, especially those courageous ones who went out into the field to tell all of those great stories and capture the incredible footage that you just saw over the last half hour. Have a great evening, everybody. Happy Labor Day. We'll see you tomorrow.